All right. Good morning, everyone. I think this is where we were last week when we left off talking about the um, finding the intersection of two lines. And this, of course, is something we've been, done, we've been doing for weeks with all those age problems and motion problems and number problems, basically developing two equations and two unknowns and then solving for you know, the joint two un unknowns using our substitution method. Well, here is just a geometric version of that. <clears throat> the uh, relationships uh, that we've been working with, mostly in those word problems, have been linear relationships. If you were to turn those uh, relationships, like for example, the um, length is twice the width. Well, you know, um, things like that. These are simple linear relationships. And uh, what we're looking for geometrically is where those two re relationships uh, agree. Uh, here, if we have the lines, which show all of the pairs, which, which you know, satisfy one relationship and another line, which has all of the pairs which satisfy the other relationship, well, right, the intersection is gonna be the place where um, <clears throat> both relationships are satisfied. So we know how to do this. Uh, we simply set uh, the equations equal to each other. They're both in the form y is equal to mx plus b. That would be the simplest substitution. Y is the same as y. So um, just making the two um, x relationships equal to each other and solving. And that's you know what we have here. Saying the two x in, equal to the nine, must, nine minus x and, and solving. <clears throat> and given the fact that these are linear relationships, they don't get much more complicated than mx plus b on either side. So these, this is not a challenge for us to solve these equations algebraically to get, uh, to get the common solution. However, if we looked at it abstractly, which is always interesting, right? Given the power of our algebra, um, to look, to look at, at these relationships uh, without numbers, but just with the letters and seeing if the algebra can tell us something, it's always interesting uh, to do this. So imagine we have two lines uh, and we'd like to find their intersection. We write them both in the standard point slope form. Uh, I'm sorry, the slope intercept form, and we would set them equal to each other. We would set m1 x plus b1 is equal to m2 x plus b2 and, and solving for x. <clears throat> we would get the x's on one side, numbers on the other, and factor out uh, x and, uh, and, and solve. <clears throat> and so the value of x uh, in terms of our m's and b's is the difference of the b's divided by the difference of the m's. Notice that we have b2 minus b1 on the top, but m1 minus m2 on the bottom. That's just the way the algebra works out. Um, that's what the solution of x would be. Solving for y, we could take that solution for x and put it into either one of the two equations to find out what y is. Here I've chosen to take the first equation and substituting for x, our solution, b2 minus b1 over m1 minus m2 and setting y equal to um, that substituted expression, clearing out the algebra a little bit. We notice that the math cards are with us a bit. We get, we get one, calculate, uh, one count cancellation at least by clearing out those brackets. And we get uh, what the y value would be for the intersection of two lines. Notice that that m1 minus m2 is still in the denominator. But now the numerator is a bit more complex. Instead of just being b2 uh, minus b1, we have the interesting richness of m1 b2 minus uh, b1, uh, m1 b2, I'm sorry, uh, it's early in the morning, m1 b2 minus b1 m2. So we have the m's kind of stuck in there. And this would, this is a perfectly valid algebraic uh, solution. For example, if we were to take the problem that we just did, uh, where the first equation m1 is two and b1 was zero. And in the other equation, nine minus x, uh, m1 is a minus one and b2 is a nine. Sure enough, if you use the algebraic formulas that we just did, stick that stuff in, uh, x would does turn out to be three when you do the arithmetic. And <clears throat> when you put all the four numbers in for y and clear out all the arithmetic and the fractions and do things carefully and 
<laughs> don't make any silly mistake with signs, you will wind up with six. And so there is our, our, our solution, three comma six. So this is a perfectly uh, um, nice algebraic solution uh, to the problem. It's hardly needed uh, given the linear equations. One can just as we easily solve each linear pair of linear equations as we would go. We hardly need a formula like this, but it is instructive to take a look uh, at what the algebra is saying. If nothing else, it's, it can sometimes be fun. It can be amusing. Well, look what happens, uh, for example, if the y-intersects are the same. If I have two lines which have the same y-intercept, then where do they cross? <laughs> yes, that is a trick question, guys. It is early in the morning for everybody, but that is a trick question. What is the color of George Washington's white horse? <clears throat> if they do have the same y-intercept, they will cross <laughs> at the y-intercept. But look at what the equation says. If in fact, B1 is equal to B2, let's call it B, a common B. Look at our solution for X. X is equal to zero over that M1 minus M2, which is zero. Yeah, sure enough. The Y intercept does always have an X value of zero. And look at what the Y value is for that intersection point. Again, making the two Bs the same, right? We can factor that B out and you have an M1 minus M2 on top and bottom, which will cancel and indeed Y is equal to B. So yes, the intersection point is the common zero B. And if the slopes are the same, where do they cross? Another trick question for you early in the morning. If the slopes are the same, where do they cross? Right, they don't because they're parallel. And let's see how the algebra will tell us that. If in fact, M1 is equal to M2, the characterization or algebraic characterization of parallel straight lines, then look what you get for X. Uh, there's where that M1 minus M2 rears its head. If M1 is equal to M2, we'll get zero in the denominator. And that's a, always a no-no in, in algebra. And so we see that X has no, has no value. There is no solution. The lines do not cross. So I asked you to try one. Here's a couple of straight lines. Uh, I, give, I have them in their, full, in their full, full dress. I didn't solve them for you. 2x minus y minus 7 is equal to 0. 4x plus 3y minus 9 is equal to 0. I asked you to find everything out about those lines, the slopes, the intercepts, where they cross, do a rough graph, have some fun. By the way, I should mention that uh, those equations, uh, th th that form of the straight line is, is, is yet the third kind of common form for a straight line. We have y is equal to mx plus b. That's probably the most uh, familiar form. That's the point intercept form. Then we have y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. That's the very powerful uh, slope uh, point, point slope form. This form here, which you could you could call, uh, which you could write as ax plus by plus c is equal to zero, where a and b and c are all constants. That's called the standard form of the straight line. Uh, you take the, uh, put everything on one side, so they put to zero. So it's called the standard form. So I'm giving you the two equations in standard form, asking you to do some work, find the slopes and the y-intercepts and all that stuff. But to find the intersection, you can certainly, you know, go ahead and uh, solve for anything you like, use the substitution method any, any way you feel. You certainly don't have to set them equal to y is equal to mx plus b, but very often that is the easiest way to go. Okay, and finally, the distance from a point to a line. This is a, a real bear. I don't know if anybody has tried this yet because we haven't gotten up to it. This is a, this is a, a, a very good example of how straightforward uh, linear uh, uh, analytic geometry can be. The steps that we want to do here, I think you'll agree, are very straightforward. The algebra is not, but actually what we want to do, if you can handle the algebra, it is very, very clear. We want to find uh, the distance from a point to a line. And of course, that, that distance is always the perpendicular distance. You would drop a perpendicular down from the point and that's the, it's that distance, okay? So, what, 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 what do you have to do? Well, the first thing we have to do is find that perpendicular point, okay? So the first thing we do is we find the equation of the line 
through P, which is perpendicular to this line. Notice I've given you the line in standard form. Okay, the reason why standard form is used here is because we're actually gonna find this distance formula in terms of A, B, and C, as opposed to Y is equal to MX plus B. Turns out the nicest, the prettiest form of this distance equation is in terms of the coefficients of the standard form. So the first thing to do is to be able to drop a perpendicular from P down to the line. Well, we need to get an equation that will, that will do that, a line perpendicular to our line, but going through P. We need to find that line. Uh, well, you know, once we find that line, we can do that. We can, we can find that line. We can know about the slopes, uh, slope of the our line this perpendicular line, we know what the slope of that would be, its relationship would be, and we can go ahead and uh, find that equation. And we would have a slope and a point, the point being the point P. We would, we would have a point and a slope, we would have a line. Well, the next step is to find the intersection of the two lines. We know how to do that. We've developed the second line and now we find out where they cross. And finally, we take the distance between P and Q. And that would be our answer. That's the distance between the point and the line. Conceptually, these problems are not difficult, but working in just pure algebra, working with AX plus BY plus C is equal to zero, and just given the point P, X zero, Y zero, the algebra here gets pretty hairy, but it's nothing that you guys can, can, can do and can't tackle. And I very much in, invite you to, to, to give this a try. Here is the answer. You'll wind up getting uh, that D squared, the distance squared will be equal to this. Okay, and this is what I mean by, uh, we find D squared in terms of our parameters, in terms of capital A, B, and C, and the point X zero, Y zero. Okay. <clears throat> All these numbers are known given the problem and we can go ahead and, and put them in. Turns out, this is when you wanna solve a, a square equation like this, then uh, th that numerator is not necessarily positive. So you take the absolute value of the top. Notice it is a perfect square. So when you take the square root of a perfect square, you just get the, the, the value, but we wanna, we wanna always take the positive value of that. And the denominator is just the square root of the denominator, the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that is a very pretty formula. Uh, there are other ways of deriving this formula than this <laughs> very, uh, you know, by the numbers kind of thing, but it's a great problem to do. It took three slides, you'll see them at the back, three slides for me to cover all the algebra. But uh, I really encourage you to, to, to try, try these three steps. Uh, first of all, you know, getting the, uh, the equation of the line through P perpendicular to our given line, find the intersection of the two lines, Q, and then finally finding the distance between P and Q. Uh, definitely, definitely a challenge to, to your algebra. Okay, I wanna end by, this was the reason why I sent the, uh, the, the, this new version of this presentation. Um, I wanted to show you one of the most important examples in the history of physics of a linear relationship. Uh, one that turned out to be a great surprise. Uh, so it's a very interesting story behind this. So let us, <clears throat> let us go through uh, Einstein's um, um, an analysis of the photoelectric effect. And this is in the very, very early days of quantum theory. So the photoelectric effect is it, it, it conceptually very, very simple. When you shine light on a metal, if the light is of the right character, electrons will pop out of the metal. Well, that in itself is not surprising. You're putting energy into this metal. It's interacting with the electrons, the matter in the metal. And if the energy being poured in is enough, who knows, all kinds of things will happen. Certainly uh, the metal will get warmer. Uh, it'll absorb energy that way. And it'll do all kinds of, it may melt if it's a laser, uh, it could cut the metal. So we're not surprising that another possible uh, reaction could be that the electrons could actually be loosened and gaining so much energy that they would leave their orbits and, uh, and leave the metal altogether. That's the photoelectric effect. Um, what was 
what was what was found was that when you shine uh, light uh, on the metal, uh, you don't get what you what you would expect. What you would expect is that the brightness of the light, the intensity of the light, is what would determine how the electrons will jump off, uh, at what energy they will jump off. That if you make the light brighter and brighter, that the amount, the energy that these electrons would be jumping off would become greater and greater and greater. And all of this would be totally independent of the color of the light, the frequency of the light, because the energy of a wave, which is what our assumption here in classical physics, the energy of a wave is in its amplitude, not in its frequency. Okay, the amplitude of a wave corresponds in light to its brightness, and the frequency of a light wave corresponds to its color. So you would expect the brightness of the light, which is the amplitude of the wave, to determine what kind of energy these electrons are, are bouncing off. You would also expect, since this wave is coming down in a continuous way, there would be some kind of a bit of a time delay. It would take a little bit of a while for the energy to build up. For example, the, uh, you know, the metal would get warmer and warmer as you shine the light on it longer and longer, until finally enough energy was absorbed that some of these electrons would have absorbed enough energy to begin to leave the metal. And this little setup here is just to have a, a, a vacuum tube. So when, the, so when and if the electrons are free, they have a path, an easy path to go from the metal that you're shining the light on onto the so-called collector plate um, to, uh, to, to be able to register that these electrons have loosened. <clears throat> um, they'll just show up as a current, literally being electrons going from one side to the other, hitting the collector plate and that would register, you know, in, in an ammeter, in, in a current meter. So that's what the, the little setup is. What was found was not what I just described. What was found that uh, for any frequency of light greater than some minimum, what's called the threshold frequency, then we will start to get free electrons. It's, de it's determined on the using a correct frequency or higher frequencies for this phenomenon to happen. It's independent of the brightness of the light. You can't get more of a contradiction to the wave theory of light. This was a tremendous, tremendous problem uh, for physicists at the turn of the century to try to, to, to figure out. And the experimental uh, um, leader on this was a physicist called, called Philip Leonard, a Nobel Prize winner in his own right, one of the, probably, probably one of the, the greatest experimental physicists of his time. And he's the one who was an expert on taking data on the, uh, photoelectric effect. Very difficult to take this data back in, uh, in the early 1900s. We're talking 1902, 1903 is when this data was collected. And uh, certainly uh, Leonard recognized that the maximum energy that the emitted electrons would have did depend upon the frequency. He found it was independent of the intensity of the light. And just the, the color of the light is what determined the, um, the, the energy coming off. He did find these threshold frequencies. Here we have two different metals, sodium and magnesium, and you, you had to get up to a certain frequency before you saw any uh, energy at all of these electrons, any current coming off at all. And he had a way of measuring the, the energy uh, of the electrons coming off. We have no time to, to go into any of that. For a different metal like magnesium, you had to wait, you had to pick up the frequency higher and higher and higher before you finally saw free electrons. Uh, uh, it took a higher frequency, a bluer light uh, frequencies, right? The low is, red is a low frequency, blue is the high frequency. Ultraviolet is even a higher frequency. So it took a higher frequency before the magnesium would give up its electrons under the photoelectric effect. He found that, and he did find as the frequency got higher and higher, for example, looking at sodium, as he picked up the frequency higher and higher, the energy that the electrons would have would get greater and greater. <clears throat> in a vague kind of way, he was not seeing any easy pattern here given the, the equipment that he had, which was the best in the world at the time. Uh, he was the, the, the best experimental physicist on this. And this is about the best data that, uh, that, 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 that he could find in those days. 
So no matter how weak the light was, as long as the frequency was above the threshold frequency, you would get the emission of these electrons from the metal. And it would start immediately with no time delay. Another contradiction to the classical wave. As soon as you turned on this blue light, boom, you would see a current flowing. Uh, if you turned on a red light, you would get nothing. You could turn on a red light as bright as you like. It would sear your skin. It would burn your eyeballs out of this in incredibly intense red light. It would, it would not free up any electrons from the metal. Whereas you turned on this very, very dim blue light, ultraviolet light, and you would start to get electrons uh, coming out with, this, with a characteristic maximum frequency. So there are those three threshold frequencies of his data. And he did find as he increased the light intensity, well, the number of electrons emitted would be more. So as the light got brighter and brighter, once you were using the right frequency, then the current would get stronger and stronger. Okay, that made sense. As the light got brighter, as long as you were using the right frequency, you would get a stronger and stronger current. That told him that more and more electrons would be coming out. But the energy of the electrons did not change. Only more of them came out. He could not change the energy of the emitted electrons only by the frequency. This was a real head scratch. People could not, using the wave theory of light, there is no way to explain this. So <laughs> we have an unknown patent clerk with, uh, who's still struggling to get his doctorate, still struggling to get his PhD thesis past the uh, review committee. He's working in a patent office. He writes five papers in 1905, one of them addressing the photo, actually, yeah, one of them addressing the photoelectric effect. This is the opening paragraph of that 1905 paper. It has been called by uh, some historians of, of, of science, the most radical se sentence of the 20, of 20th century physics. So let me read this uh, to you. Einstein's beginning paper on the photoelectric effect of 1905. This 26 year old patent clerk writes, it seems to me, <laughs> who are you? It seems to me that the observations associated with black body radiation, fluorescence, the production of cathode rays by ultraviolet light, that's our photoelectric effect, and other related phenomena connected with the emission or transmission of light are more readily understood if one assumes that the energy of light is discontinuously distributed in space. Light is not a wave. In accordance with the assumption to be considered here, the energy of a light ray spread out from a point source is not continuously distributed over an increasing space, but consists of a finite number of energy quanta which are localized at points in space, which move without dividing and which can only be produced and absorbed as complete units. Light is not a wave. That's what this 26 year old Platten Kirk is saying. He says this will explain the photoelectric effect and, and in fact other things that the quantum uh, phenomenon was, uh, was beginning to be uncovered. This is the paper that won him the Nobel Prize in 1921. It took until 1921, it took 16 years before the physics community could finally be comfortable enough with this idea to award him uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize. Many people think he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his papers on special relativity, also published in the same year. But um, no, this in fact was the really revolutionary idea which the, which the Nobel uh, Committee uh, uh, recognized. So here's, uh, here's Einstein's explanation. He says the interaction between a photon, these bullets of, of light that I'm hypothesizing, and an electron in the metal is unique. It's an elementary act where the photon comes down, hits the metal, <clears throat> and can give up that energy using Planck's formula E is equal to HF. This is the fundamental formula that Planck had discovered five years earlier uh, about the nature of, of light energy. He found this formula only in a very specialized context. Planck had no notion, no one had any notion that in general, light would, would, would have this kind of a relationship to its, 
to its frequency. Only in this very special context of black body radiation, no time to talk about that, he found that the, 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 the only way to make sense of how the energy uh, as the light was, was pr being produced was uh, in, this, in this way, proportional to the, proportional to the frequency. Einstein's going to take this idea and say, no, 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 it's not just about black body radiation. This is the nature of light. Light has this, this property that its energy is found in its frequency. <clears throat> and he's going to run with this idea. He says, so the, so the electron is kept in the metal by electrical forces, not surprising, and can only escape if a certain minimum amount of energy is given to it. Yeah, makes sense. And the particular uh, amount of energy will depend upon the particular metal. Okay, yeah, different metals will hold electrons with different strengths. That sentence is fine. Everyone's happy with a sentence like that, just talking about the energy uh, and in the abstract. Thus, the frequency of the photon must be above a certain threshold frequency if you're going to reach this energy because of Planck's formula E is equal to HF, not the amplitude, but the frequency. Therefore, you need some kind of a threshold frequency. Once you're above the threshold frequency, the electrons will absorb the photon energy immediately and they will escape immediately with no time delay. There solves that problem. If we increase the energy of the photon by increasing the frequency, then the electrons will interact with these photons and they'll come off with increased energies, just as uh, uh, the, the, the uh, data showed. And finally, if we increase the intensity of the light, the brightness of the light, we will increase the number of photons being produced and therefore the number of electrons which escape will be increased. Yeah, we will see a higher of uh, current being produced, but the maximum increased the maximum energy will not increase because you have not increased the frequency. This is his explanation. It sounds it certainly fits uh, the phenomenon. He says, "Look, it's actually very simple. What I'm saying, all we're talking about here is the conservation of energy." We have the energy of the photon coming in, HF, according to Planck's formula. I'm using it in a very, very general way. I'm taking this, any old light coming from a lamp, yes, the energy coming down is proportional to the frequency, it has nothing to do with black body radiation. So that's the incoming energy, Planck's formula HF. It hits the, it, it hits the, the metal. What happens on the other side? Well, we need a certain amount of energy to free the electron from the metal, that's that threshold frequency times H. That's the amount of energy that the, that the metal takes from the light to free it up. Whatever's left, that's the kinetic energy of the electron. That's what we're registering in our measurements. That's how we're seeing the current. By the free electron, the kinetic energy, the energy of motion that the electron now has because it's free and it'll move over to the collector plate. All I'm saying is we simply have a balance of the conservation of energy. The energy pouring down into the metal as HF, the energy of the, of, the, of the interaction of the threshold frequency being used up to free it, plus whatever is left. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at this in terms of the equations, solving for the energy, taking that top equation and solve for the energy, the energy is a function of the frequency. Yeah, the energy of the electrons that we're measuring, the measured energy of the electrons now, the data that we're taking is equal to HF minus HF zero. I simply solve that equation for E. Well, guys, look at that. That is a linear equation, okay? The energy is a linear equation of the frequency. It's in the form Y is equal to MX plus B, where the slope M is nothing more than H. That's the, this constant, given the proportionality of energy and frequency. This is the famous Planck constant of quantum theory. He says, yeah, the slope that you'll get, if you ever can take really good data, <laughs> if we get better enough equipment that you can actually take very accurate data, what you'll find is that there, this relationship that you're measuring, you will get a straight line with the slope of Planck's constant. You'll be able to measure Planck's constant for the first time. We, we're never able to measure it from the black body process. Here's a way to measure Planck's constant because you'll get a straight line when you take good data. And the B number is uh, related 
to the, to the threshold frequency. This is the kind of data that you'll get, okay? <clears throat> you'll get a slope of H, you'll get these threshold frequencies, nothing will start until you get a high enough frequency for sodium, you'll need a higher frequency to get the game started with magnesium. And finally, the x-intercepts, we know how to find the x-intercept, you set the function equal to zero. You said hf minus hf zero is equal to zero, you factor out the h, and what are we left with? We're left at f is equal to f zero. Yeah, sure. The threshold frequencies are in fact where we will cross the x-axis. This is nothing more than what we've studied as a linear relationship. People said no. <laughs> we understand your explanation, as crazy as it is, explains everything. Your explanation makes no sense because light is a wave. Okay? But Planck and his formula of five years ago, even he wasn't happy with that formula. Everyone is still looking for a different explanation for the black body process. No one wants to stay with this HF business. You are now broadening it to the whole very nature of light. No, we're not going there. We're not walking away from classical physics. Not in 1905, we're not. So no one is, is accepting this, but it is compelling once we start to get good data. Well, the great uh, American physicist uh, Millikan, he's the fellow who won a Nobel Prize for measuring the charge on an electron, he was one of the conservative groups said, no, 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 this, this is not right. I, Milligan, will take the data. I will go ahead and improve these techniques. I will invent new uh, you know, devices to take accurate data and show that, that no, this is not what you get. The, the phenomenon of what's going on is much more complicated. And he spent 10 years uh, working on this after his, his work on the, on the mass of uh, the charge of the electron. He spent 10 years uh, doing experiments, developing new techniques to take more accurate data. And this is his data, guys. Yeah, this is his data. It's exactly what Einstein said. It's a slope of H. It's a threshold frequency. And, you know, what can you say? Well, this is what Millikan said. Millikan said Einstein's photoelectric equation appears in every case to predict exactly the desired results. Yet, this semi-corpuscular theory which Einstein arrived at his equation seems at present wholly untenable. This is 1916. He still, this is, this is the most important uh, scientist in, uh, in America, Millikan, okay? the most respected scientist in America. He will not accept this and he is not alone. Even though his own data shows that, that Einstein's at least mathematical analysis is correct. So I wanted to give you that, that wonderful example of straight lines in physics. Oh yeah, they're there. They're there and they're, and they're important. <clears throat> Many years later, uh, uh, Millikan wrote after his retirement, they basically built MIT around him they took the small, I'm sorry, Caltech. They took the small dinky college, nothing college in California. They made him the president. They gave, gave him kind of an unlimited budget. They said, hire the smartest people you know. And eventually they, re, they rechristened it Caltech. <clears throat> he said, I spent 10 years of my life uh, testing that 1905 equation of Einstein. And contrary to all my expectations, I was compelled in 1915 to assert its unambiguous verification. In spite of the unreasonableness, since it seems to violate everything we knew about the interference of light. So, okay, as I switch presentations, are there any, are there any questions on what we've talked about here about the straight line? Nothing in the chat at this point. Okay. But Let's Melissa, I, yes, I I had a question about um, in, in increasing the frequency. So there was a threshold frequency that was in the blue range of light to get the electrons to emit. Correct. And so, 
as metals were changed, it um, that frequency had to the frequency had to change. It took higher and higher frequencies Correct. to do that. Correct. Okay. It, yeah. Does it? And so that's what that really, line is. That line is showing yeah. energy. It's measuring energy against frequency. If frequency goes up, the energy goes up higher and higher. That's what that and straight so line is. It all, would, it all, would it always, for all metals in the periodic table, would it have to start with the, the within the blue frequency? Oh, then, I, I, we, you know, I'm sorry. We really can't go into a whole okay. of this. Yeah. That's the physics. I, I tell you, if you're interested in the photoelectric effect in this whole thing, I can recommend my lecture from last term when I gave the class in, in quantum theory. If you want yes. to go to, to, to my YouTube channel and look at the previous class on, on yeah, Paul yeah. quantum, if you look in the playlists, you know, you'll see the quantum there. If you look at lecture five, class five, if you want to play that, the first hour of that goes through Planck's equation of the black body and then is a much longer explanation for the photoelectric effect, very much what I what I did in 15 minutes uh, there we, we can be done uh, in an hour if you want to check out uh, that video. It's class five of the cold uh, quantum theory. You'll find it out there in the uh, in my YouTube channel. Okay, so let's take a look at the analytic geometry of the circle and the parabola because we want to get ready for our last class next um, uh, next Thursday, and this will set the um, the, uh, the, the foundation for it. First of all, the circle. Circle is relatively easy. So let's start with the easiest circle, the circle with the center at the origin. We have a point uh, A, three, four. Uh, we can go ahead and find the distance using the distance formula and be nothing more than uh, X one squared plus Y one squared minus the zeros. Um, and we would get a distance here of five, okay? But if we were to ask, well, what about all the points that have a distance of five? Well, that of course is the locus of a circle. That's the definition of a circle. And <clears throat> it's the locus of points equidistant from a certain fixed point. So if I took an arbitrary point with just arbitrary coordinates x, y, and it would have a radius r, a fixed radius here in this case of five, I could say that x squared plus y squared square root is equal to five. That would characterize that point z. If I square both sides, I get the general equation for the line of, of a radius of five. And in general, the, 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 the defining equation for a, a circle uh, in the origin of radius r is x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. <clears throat> the distance formula collapses because we're working from the origin. So it's zero minus zero is what we're taking from the distance formula. So there's a simplification there. And of course we have always r squared. So that's the formula for, uh, for the equation of a circle. We've now characterized a circle uh, using our analytic geometry. It's not, it's not far to take the general equation where the center is not at the origin, but at a coordinates x, x, I'm sorry, h, k. These are traditional letters that are used in mathematics, guys. I'm not picking these arbitrarily. When you go ahead and consult a math book on analytic geometry, you will find very often that these are the letters that are used to characterize the, at the center of a, of a circle, the focus of an ellipse and things like this. So again, we take an, an arbitrary point a certain distance away, take a distance r, take an arbitrary point uh, z with coordinates x, y, and find the distance between our center and z. There's the distance formula <clears throat> right there. It's equal to r. That's our, our assumption that we're a, a certain distance away. And that characterizes all the points. Any point on that circle will satisfy that equation. If we square both sides, <laughs> we have the general equation of a circle with center HK. Okay, so not not at all not at all surprising. A nice a nice formula. We've characterized uh, virtually any circle uh, in the Cartesian plane, <clears throat> given any center and any radius. So find the equation of a circle with center three, one and passing through the point four, five. The first thing we do is use the distance formula to get the radius. Turns out to be square root of 17. And we simply write down the equation. If the center is three, one, the equation is X minus three squared plus Y minus one squared is equal to the square of the radius, which is 17. Okay, you try one.
<laughs> have some fun and try one. I've asked you to do a little bit of work. I've, I've given you the diameter of the circle. I said, suppose that the circle has a diameter from minus five, minus three, all the way over to one five. You gotta do a little bit of work to find the center. Okay. This is a teacher's dream, this, this, this problem here, to find a circle given three points. We have to know virtually everything that we have covered so far in analytic geometry to do this problem. Teachers love problems like this. How are we going to find, if I give you three points, how do we find the equation of the circle? <clears throat> well, not surprisingly, we have to go to Euclid. Euclid tells us if you take a, a, a line, a, a tangent line, see, I'm sorry, a secant line uh, from uh, uh, a circle and you bisect it, that dotted line will go through the center of the circle. This is a theorem from Euclid. So if we took another such line, and bisected it, we know that it's got to go through the circle, us through the center of the circle. Well, therefore, where it crosses is the center of the circle. And this is how you would go ahead and find the center. You see where I'm going with this. Now that we have the center, you take any one of the three points that you like and find the, find the, the radius. We have a center, we have a radius. You see why teachers would love a question like this. Okay, so let's go through it very quickly. You want to find the equation, the dotted line through the, through the perpendicular bisector. Well, the first thing I have to do is find the midpoint uh, of, uh, of AB. Okay, go ahead and use the midpoint formula. Once I have AB, if I want to find the slope of the dotted line, I need the slope of AB. The slope of AB turns out to be uh, 1 7. So therefore, the slope of our dotted line is the reciprocal, the negative reciprocal. So it's minus 7. I have a slope, I have a point U, I can write down the, uh, the point slope formula for our, our blue line. I do exactly the same thing with the red line, exactly the same uh, steps, find the equation of the red dotted line. Find out where they cross, right? Set, set them equal to each other, solve the equation. I find that X is equal to one and it turns out Y is equal to one for this particular equation. There's our center. And finally, to get our, I actually don't even need our, really what I want is our squared uh, for, my, for my circle formula. So just taking the square, and I've been bothering with the square root sign, r squared is find the distance formula from my point x. I chose here my point b, could have point, picked any other point, gotten 25, and voila, the equation of the circle. Okay, this is a great problem. <laughs> you need to kind of do everything that we, that, that, we, that we did. Okay, so give it a try. Have some fun. This is nice. I left some of the structure for you, uh, but uh, all, all, all the work has to be filled in uh, by you guys. And the equation of a tangent line. Well, my goodness, after that one, geez, this is, this is easy. We just need to dip into Euclid one more time. Okay? <clears throat> if we're going to translate geometry, into these algebraic relationships, we need to understand as much as we can about the geometry of these things. <clears throat> Euclid's Elements, the 13 books is all about points, lines, and circles. So yes, he tells us what we need to know uh, about the tangent line. The tangent line to a circle is always perpendicular to the radius line. Theorem out of Euclid that we will use. So how do we find the equation of the tangent line to this point x0, y0, I give you the point x0, y0. This is a known point. <clears throat> well, I want to get the point slope form of that red line. So I need the slope of that, of that line. Well, I know the slope of the radius line, right? The radius line is, <clears throat> is y0 over x0. Just go ahead and apply the, the point slope form, um, to the slope formula. I do have the center, right? That's 0, 0, makes that simple. And so the slope uh, of, uh, of, the, of the radius line is y0 over x0. Therefore, the slope of my uh, tangent line is the negative reciprocal of that, which is minus x0 over y0. I have a point and a, and a, and a, and a slope. I immediately write down the equation of the tangent line. No muss, no fuss. You see the power of the, of the point, uh, point slope form. I can write that, do a little bit of algebraic manipulation. I can write that in standard form. And this is very often how you'll see the equation of the tangent line of a circle. 
It's written very often in recognize that in standard form. This is AX plus BY plus C is equal to zero. The, these are all parameters. These are the points. Uh, these are the coordinates of the point that we're talking about where we want to find the tangent line. And uh, C of course is just uh, <clears throat> the sum of their, uh, of their squares. So it's very often written as a, as a, in, in standard form. We get a little fun with this. We could ask, for example, what does the formula tell us when X zero is zero? That is right here when we're on the Y axis. Uh, what will the tangent line be when X zero is zero? Well, we know that then we will get zero Y zero. Now, that's not the same as this Y zero, but just some, some value Y zero because X is zero. Well, if we look at the formula here, just make X zero zero. This term will go away. This value here will go away. And all we're left with in the standard form is y0, y minus y0 squared is equal to zero. Factor out a y0 and solve and we get y is equal to y0, yeah. That is the correct equation for the tangent of, of the line up there. y is equal to y0, which of course we know would have to be r. And just checking out What's the story? What is the equation of the tangent line when y zero is equal to zero? That's this point here. We're along the y axis, that's the x axis now. Y zero is zero. And what does the equation tell us? Well, make y zero zero. We're just left with x zero. X is equal to x zero squared. <clears throat> Factor out the x zero term from, from each. And we're left with x minus x zero is equal to zero and x is equal to x zero. And that is the equation of the, uh, I'm sorry, that is the equation of the tangent line. <clears throat> uh, it's, the, it's our vertical line. So I tried to stress the equation by taking extreme points and the algebra holds up, okay? That's my point. We, we notice that we, we, we derived our equation not thinking about these very extreme points of slopes of zero and slopes of infinity. We went ahead and derived our algebra using a very simple point to get our equation, but yet the algebra holds up. Okay, what, 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 what mathematicians like to say in cases like this, and I've tried to point this out a few times during our course, the algebra is smarter than we are. The math is smarter than we are. We get more back from the algebra than we deserve. <laughs> we weren't looking at these extreme cases, but yet here they are. And you go ahead and try one. Try to get the equation of the tangent of, uh, of, of that red line. <clears throat> tangents will become very, very important for us. Looking at tangent lines is one half of the calculus. So we're very much interested in tangents to, uh, to curves, slopes of tangents to curves. <clears throat> and the, uh, the last thing about the, uh, about the circle that I want to mention before we get to the parabola is the standard equation for a circle. The easiest way to get to the standard equation is to take our so-called center radius form of the equation, uh, the equation which shows us literally if we had to read it, what the center of the circle is, hk, and what the radius is, r squared there. If we just go ahead and square all that out, clear up the algebra, collect everything, then we can read it, write it as x squared plus y squared plus ax plus by plus c is equal to zero. And that would that is what we call the standard equation uh, of the circle. <clears throat> Notice that a is nothing more than minus two h, b is nothing more than minus two k, and c is what's left. C is all the other constant terms, h squared plus k squared minus r squared. Okay. So this is the standard form of an equation uh, I'm sorry, of a circle. And if I gave you a, a, an equation like this, you would recognize this as a circle because the three X squared is the same as the three Y squared, right? You need to have the same coefficient in front of the X squared and Y squared. That's the upshot. When you look at the standard equation, you need X squared and Y squared to be just having the same one in front. So there's no problem. If you have a couple of threes in front, just go ahead and divide by three and you'll get the x squared and y squared, both having just a one in front, you recognize that as a form of the standard equation, okay? 
but what it, but what circle? Okay, what circle is this standard equation representing? This you'll like. What we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to transform the standard form into our center radius form. We're going to work backwards. We're going to go from our standard form and write it as the um, center radius form. And how we're going to do this, this you'll like. We're going to complete the square twice. So we start by writing down the standard form. We make some room. <laughs> we make some room for, this, for, uh, for, 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 for the completing the square process. Move over a little bit, pair, 6x. Move over there, 2y. Gotta, we know we're going to stick numbers in here because we want to write down perfect squares. <laughs> so x squared plus 6x, yeah, that's x plus 3 squared, right? We have that 6, we get 3. Got to compensate for it. It's gonna, we're adding a, a nine. Don't, don't want to lose the equality. So we write a, a negative nine. Equality is preserved. We looked at that minus two. Why cut that in half, get a minus one. Uh, we're, gonna, we're adding a plus one there as extra when we square that bracket. Better add a minus one to keep the equality going. <clears throat> and now just self, just bring those, those compensating numbers to the other side. And we have the, the uh, point radius slow, uh, equation of the circle. Okay. <clears throat> that circle x squared plus y squared plus six x minus two y minus seven is equal to zero is nothing more than a circle of center minus three one with a radius of radical 17. Cute, huh? A nice use of, uh, of completing the square. Or we could go back to these equations here. We don't really need them. Putting the square is so easy and so nice. But yeah, we did this algebra once. Why don't we just go ahead and use it? <clears throat> if A is six, we know that A is equal to minus two H. So minus two H is six. So H is minus three. And B is minus two. Looking at the standard equation, B is there as so a minus two. Minus 2k is equal to b, so k is equal to 1. There's our minus 3, 1. Don't need to complete the square. We just go ahead and use these equations. And finally, we could solve. We know, now that we know h and k, we now can solve for r squared. Do a little bit of arithmetic and get r squared to be 17. Okay. So you have, you have your choice, but I think completing the square is, is very nice and very easy. And it's just who needs to memorize more formulas. <clears throat> it's very interesting, this equation for, for, for r squared, uh, the radius, <clears throat> h squared plus k squared minus c. That's what r squared is, according to our algebra. If you're going to get a real circle, guys, you need a real r. You need r to be greater than zero. You need h squared plus k squared minus c to be a number greater than zero if you want radius to be you know, real, something out there that we have a true circle. So notice that means that h squared plus k squared had better be bigger than c. I just brought the c to the other side of the great, greater sign. I added a plus c to both sides with the greater sign. But that's all, but that is always going to be true, right, if c is negative. If c is negative, then h squared plus k squared is always going to be bigger than a negative number. <clears throat> so uh, notice that if c is less than or equal to zero, you know you've got yourself a, a nice circle, like here like the minus seven. We know we're not gonna run into any, any problem because of the negative C. Suppose R squared was equal to zero. Perfectly possible, it's perfectly possible that you could pick H, K, and C and write down an equation where H squared plus K squared minus C is equal to zero. <clears throat> no reason why you couldn't do that arithmetically. The algebra tells us that R therefore would be equal to zero. Well, what's a circle with a zero radius? It's a point, <laughs> it's a geometric point, and that's exactly what that locus would be. If you write down an equation where h squared plus k squared is equal to a c, you will only find one point that will make that equation true, the center of the collapsed circle. And finally, if you had r squared to be negative, no problem, you can make it, you can pick h squared and k squared and c so that h squared plus k squared minus c turns out to be a negative number. 
no problem. Just make that C a very, very large positive number. If you make C a really large positive number, you're gonna overwhelm the H squared plus K squared. And when you subtract that C, you're gonna wind up with a negative number there for R. Not hard to do at all. <clears throat> what happens if you write down such an equation where your R squared is, the algebra tells us that the R squared is zero, you'll get no radius at all. There will be no X and Ys that make this equation true. What you have is an imaginary circle. <laughs> Perfectly good algebra, but you can't graph it on the Cartesian plane. And the points don't exist as real numbers. So again, just trying to point out that the algebra tells us a lot, tells us more than we deserve to know sometimes. And I asked you to try one, okay? The standard from this, from the, uh, from the, from the, from a standard equation, I haven't fooled around. I just gave you x squared plus y squared. Don't ask you to divide through by anything. But here's a standard here's a standard uh, version of the of the equation of a circle to find the center and the radius of the circle by completing the square. That's what I recommend you do. It's the fun way to do it. All right. So we come to our last topic, the parabola. Before I go on, is there any questions that we we ran through the circle pretty quickly? I I realize, but uh, Think straightforward stuff, but any questions on the circle? Okay. Not. Okay. Remember this slide from our presentation on functions when we were talking about introducing functions. And this, I showed this picture with this function here of a ball is thrown straight up from the top of an eight foot cliff with a speed of 64 feet per second. Then the height of the ball will be given as a function of time. I ask you to take this equation uh, on faith that the height h does depend upon the time according to this equation, 80 plus 64t minus 16t squared, okay? <clears throat> and uh, you can graph that. You can make a, a, a distance time graph here uh, at, when t is zero, it starts at the height of 80, the ball goes up as time goes on, reaches some highest point, and then begins to fall back down and hits the ground. And we talked a little bit about um, uh, the, the, this equation. I even think we asked a question, for example, when does it hit the ground? That's when f of t is equal to zero. Right? We were looking for that. We solved this quadratic equation and got minus one and five. There's the five there. It hits the ground when t is equal to five. There's the minus one. We asked you know, if that made any sense. Could, could that make any sense? I said, well, maybe at some point we will understand and now we can see that if this, in fact, is the, uh, the graph of that equation, then minus one does complete this figure, what it, this geometric figure, um, the parabola. <clears throat> Remember, we asked uh, if, we, uh, if we took six we went and we got a minus, I think, 112, if I recall. Would that make any sense? Uh, yeah, it would be a valid number if there was a hole in the ground and that we were able to allow this ball to proceed along um, this path, it would be at six, it would be down around the hundred and whatever that number is. <clears throat> okay. So we ask questions like this. What this represents is the scenario of, of throwing the ball straight up, but from up here, <laughs> from 80 feet high. So we got to take this guy and pick him up 80 feet. And that's what this uh, example is, throwing the ball straight up and you get this equation. Notice that this is not the trajectory of the ball. This is a distance time graph. The ball goes straight up and straight down. This is as time goes on, this is how the height changes. And it is a parabola, as we'll see. However, if we take this situation, we wanna, we, these are the two situations that we wanna look at uh, uh, for the rest of our course. We will look at basically dropping something down, free fall, which would be similar to what, and this guy here, throwing a ball straight out. If you throw a ball straight out from a cliff, this is what you will get. You will also get a parabola. <clears throat> However, this is the true trajectory of the ball. This is the height and this is another distance. This is as the ball drops as it goes out further and further from the base of the cliff. This is also a mathematical parabola. This is not a distance time graph. This is truly 
the trajectory of the ball in space. And this is the motion that we're most particularly interested in showing. This is the great result that Galileo was able to show. For the first time, he took his laws of nature and was able to deduce a true trajectory of something moving in the world based upon his laws of nature. This is our goal for next week. We wanna start with free fall, is first of all his law of free fall and combine that to get this motion here. So we're gonna study variations of this kind of a parabola. So this is the parabola that I would like to focus on. The parabola is more general than this. Um, the vertex can be virtually anywhere. The parabola doesn't have to be turned upside down. The traditional one right, is upside up. But this is the one we'll find physically that is of interest to us when we wanna study the, the uh, projectile. So this is the one I wanna focus on for the rest of our class today. I wanna to focus on the mathematical properties of this kind of parabola. So when we come to Galileo's analysis, we'll have the mathematical tools ready. Just as when we went ahead and looked at Einstein's explanation of his linear relationship for the photoelectric effect, we knew about the slope and the, and the x-intercept and we understood that these mathematical properties had real physical meaning that the slope was Planck's constant, that the, that the x-intercept was the, was the threshold frequency. We could see immediately how the math is telling us about the physics. I wanna do the same thing here with the projectile. So when we derive the equation for the projectile, I wanna say, ah, look at what, at what the math is telling us about the actual trajectory of the projectile. That's why we're going to work right now abstractly for the last 15 minutes here of today of the mathematical properties of this projector, uh, of, of, the, of the parabola. Here's our traditional parabola that we're used to uh, looking at. It's right side up <laughs> in that sense. The definition of a parabola is very interesting. It's a completely geometric definition. A parabola is the locus of points equidistant from a point, which is called the focus, and a line, which is called the directories. Clearly this is a more complex a locus than a circle. The locus of a circle is all the points equidistant from a point. Parabola is more interesting, it's more complicated. It's the locus of points equidistant from a point and a line, okay? So this point here, for example, is on the parabola because the distance from the focus is the same as the distance down to the line. And you always mean the perpendicular distance. This point here is also good because the distance from the focus to that point is the same as the distance down to the directrix from that point, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> Here's the easiest point, I guess, conceptually uh, of all, it's the point right in the middle. Okay. If you draw a perpendicular line down from the focus down to the directrix, the guy right in the middle certainly satisfies the locus. It's equidistant from the focus and the directrix. Okay. Traditionally, that letter is P that's used. If you look in most analytic geometry books for the derivation that we're going to do, uh, the parameter that's used for that distance between focus and directrix, directrix is labeled as 2p, so that the distance from the vertex to the focus is just p. Okay. One more, one more uh, definition, if I may, one more piece of vocabulary. If you drop the perpendicular from the focus down to the directrix, that, that line is called the axis of the parabola. It's a very important line uh, because the parabola is symmetric about that line, okay? We simply just dropped a perpendicular from the focus down, the down to the directrix. So it turns out all the points on the parabola are literally symmetric around, uh, around that line. And it's called the axis of the parabola. Uh, we, will, we will study very many interesting properties of the parabola that deals with the axis uh, when we get to our class uh, in the spring, when we have the tools of the calculus uh, available to us. We will come back to the parabola, to the more general parabola. Okay, so let's derive the equation of the parabola. Here's our last major major slide here in the sense. Uh, let's derive that, 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 that equation from, from the locus definition. We're going to call the distance from the focus to the directrix 2p. You can see why, uh, wh wh where we're getting at. And we're simply going to say, therefore, if this is 2p, this is the origin, here's our x, y axis. 
working with a parabola where the, where the axis of the parabola is the y-axis, a very particular parabola that we're concerned about. <clears throat> um, so I dropped my perpendicular, so this is the y-axis. So the focus, therefore, is at zero p, and the directrix is therefore y is equal to minus p. Okay, I hope that's good. If this is zero, zero, and this is p up, then this is zero p, and this is the line y is equal to minus p. Well, let's just apply our locus definition. We're told that the parabola is the locus of points where the distance from any point, take any point on the parabola you like, the distance from z to f must be the same as the distance from z down to the directrix. Well, let's apply our analytic geometry. Here's our distance formula from z to, from z to, um, to f, okay? Um, Oh, I'm, guys, I'm very sorry. I've made a, I've made a mistake here. This, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I saw the Z and I panicked. <clears throat> this is not a mistake. <clears throat> okay, so the, the point F is zero P. We put it into the distance formula with X, Y, and there's our distance formula here. The distance uh, from Z down to the directrix is even easier. It's simply Y plus P. The distance all the way down to the directrix is the height y down to the x-axis plus the distance p. Let's square both sides. The math gods are with us. We get some nice cancellations. And there is a very typical example of how the equation of the problem is written. You'll see this very often uh, uh, in analytic geometry. It's a very nice equation. There's only, no fractions involved. It's easy to compute. Uh, x's and y's from this equation. So this is the equation of the parabola where the axis is the y-axis. Very stylized parabola here, it's not the general one. We of course are interested in y as a function of x. Okay, that's important for us. So we wanna solve that equation for y, not a big deal, by both sides by four p. And so this is the equation for the parabola with, with the y-axis as the axis of the parabola is equal to x squared, uh, over 4p. <clears throat> and this is the equation that, that, that we were after. Okay. Of course, we can easily you know, uh, modify this equation very easily by just adding a constant term. Okay. Here's our traditional parabola here. We've added a two to everything. We've picked the whole thing up by two, didn't change the x squared over 4p. P is still the same, just picking it up. We could bring it down by three. We can go up and down. It's the same basic form, I'm just changing uh, this constant term outside. I could turn the parabola upside down, take, take our basic one and just write it as minus x squared over four p. You could think of that as a negative p. It's really a very fruitful way to look upon that is p is actually a negative. I haven't actually changed the form, just p is a, is a negative number. I could take that and move it up and down, add the whole, add three to the whole thing. So I can take my basic equation, as long as I leave the axis of the, my parabola, the y-axis, I can shift this thing up and down uh, pretty easily. And so we wind up, I think I convince you that the general equation of our, of our parabola with the axis being the y-axis is uh, x squared over four p plus some constant. Okay? If the constant is zero, then we're at the origin. Okay, well, let's do one. <clears throat> Let's take a general equation of our parabola, ax squared plus c. This is what Galileo is going to derive. He's going to derive the trajectory of a, of a ball being thrown out from a cliff. We're gonna derive the equation a, uh, <coughs> ax squared plus c, where x is the distance out and y is the, you know, is the height down and uh, He's gonna derive it with these parameters, A and C. And what do they mean? What do they mean physically? Well, let's see what they mean mathematically. Okay. Last, last slide. So I'll take an example, minus X squared over two plus four. Let's analyze all the characteristics, the mathematical characteristics of this wonderful parabola, minus X squared over two plus four. <clears throat> a is equal to a minus a half and C is equal to four. And this is the graph. Okay, if we were to graph that. <clears throat> what do I mean by all the characteristics? I want to know P. 
I want to know the vertex. I want to know the focus. I want to know the directrix. I'm greedy. I want to know more. I want to know the y-intercept. I want to know the x-intercepts. Yeah, there's a lot more to know about a parabola than a straight line. A straight line, all we really needed to know were the two intercepts. Only crosses, you know, in two places. The parabola has a much richer characterization. And I want to know all these things. Let's do it. <clears throat> I write down our equation. These, I have this form ax squared plus c. I know that's equal to x squared over 4p plus c. Ah, well, the c's are the same. That's easy. <laughs> A is 1 over 4p. Okay. P is therefore 1 over 4a, just solving for p. Well, we'll look over there. P is minus a half. So 1 over 4 times minus a half is itself minus a half. This, guys, is a complete coincidence. Yeah, that A and P are the same. Look at this equation. Okay, so bring the P up. A, P is equal to a quarter. Yeah, if A is a half, P better be a half. A half only times a half is a quarter. Okay, this is a complete coincidence because of the one quarter. If A was something different, P would not be the same as a. All right. So we've got p. What's the vertex? Well, we're on the we're on the y-axis. The vertex is zero f of zero, right? It's the functional value of zero. Well, that's easy. That's c. Okay, so the vertex is nothing more than c. We knew that. We knew that was four. Okay, the vertex is zero, four. What's the focus? Ah, now we bring in our p. We know the focus is from the vertex up and down. <clears throat> the formula is it's the vert is the vertex plus p. You may be a little worried about that because my goodness, that looks like we're higher than c. No, no, no. P is negative. Yes, p is a negative one half. The algebra comes to our rescue. We're actually subtracting a half from the four, and we're getting uh, seven halves. Okay. The algebra is smarter than we are. <clears throat> the directrix is c minus p. Don't worry. That minus p is above the vertex because P is negative. So there's our directrix. Putting in our numbers of four and minus a half, we get nine halves as the directrix. The y-intercept, of course, is, uh, is there. It's the vertex, right? Because we're working with a, uh, an axis of the y-axis. So that's nothing new. We've already found that. It's the x-intercept which is, which is uh, important for us. Yeah, it's the zeros of the function. It's where the function crosses the x-axis, okay? And we go ahead and solve that the equation for the zeros and we get the square root of minus c over a. That raises two red flags immediately for us in algebra, that a down the bottom. Hmm, is that a problem? No, if a is zero, guys, you have no parabola. A is the number in front of the x squared. If you have no a, you have no parabola, you have no issue, you have no problem. However, the square roots are, we can't have negative numbers under the, under the radical. That will give us imaginary numbers. We don't want that. We'll get, uh, we'll, we won't get any roots there, okay? <clears throat> Notice that's minus C over A. The only way it's not to get negative numbers here, we have C and A must be of opposite sign. See, if C and A are both positive, then that minus C is gonna kill us. It's gonna give us a negative number. If C and A are both negative, it's going to turn that minus C into positive. We're going to get a positive or a negative. We're going to get an imaginary number. So C and A has to be uh, either both positive or both negative in order to get any, any roots uh, at all. And we'll see that in a minute. <clears throat> For our problem here, we don't have a problem. We have C and A R of opposite signs, a plus four and a minus one half. You do the arithmetic and you'll get uh, plus and minus radical uh, two. I'm sorry, plus and minus two radical two. Okay, um, here, uh, how do we remember all this stuff? This, this is, this is the key to remember uh, these equations is we basically, once we have the vertex, we're on either side, the focus and the thing. Okay. So I asked you to try one. Here's another equation. Find all these things just the way I have. <clears throat> okay. In the last minute, let me just sh show you Picture is worth a thousand words. Just give me one minute to run through this with you. I think you'll find this uh, fun. <clears throat> so 
So here's the parabola that we're interested in, okay? And we know we can change uh, C to our heart's content. We can go up and down as long as uh, the A value is zero, we have no problem. Notice here's where we develop the roots, okay? It's only when the A number is positive and the C number is negative, that's when we'll get roots. That's when we won't get a negative number under the square root sign, okay? If, you, uh, if you're up above, the A number is positive, the C number is positive, no roots. Still a disaster, all it means is the whole parabola is above the x-axis, that's all, okay? By the way, this is the focus, this is the directory, <laughs> okay? I can turn this thing uh, upside down, okay, by changing A, to get A broader and broader and broader, okay? There's our P number of one, and when A is the fourth, P is one, okay? The distance between the vertex and the uh, focus, okay? Let's go around the other way and we've got roots. Why do we have roots? Because we have a negative A and a positive C. And we can run this guy up and down. We'll have roots as, soon as, as long as we have that. As soon as we get a negative A and a negative C, we lose our roots, okay? So th there, you, th there you are, there, there you have it. Can I close this thing? No, go away, you won't close, all right. All right. <clears throat> Okay. All right. So that is it, guys. That is uh, our study of the parabola that we need for our study of the projectile. Are there any questions before we go? Anybody want to open the mic and, uh, and ask a question? There was one in the chat. I don't Great. know if he'd like to ask his own question. Yes, please. Question. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> First of all, hit the unmute. No? It goes back to a, a, you read couple, it, Jenny? a couple slides ago. Okay. How does one over four times um, negative one half equal negative one half? Oh, that's just arithmetic. Just, just, just look at the arithmetic there. Here we go. Uh, it might be a confusion of the way it's yeah, written. Just let me see if we get it. <clears throat> okay, so this negative one half is with the four. Okay, this is with the four. So half of four is two and the negative is negative two. So it's, you get a negative two down the bottom. Yeah, I think the confusion could be that you have to realize I'm multiplying this negative one half times the four. It is four times all of, uh, all of A. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions before we go? All right, guys, if you wanna, like I say, if you wanna kind of solidify this in your own mind, try those exercises. Uh, they're really easy, but you'll be surprised. Like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> I can see that. Now, now, now I really understand, I've, I, I've done it myself. All right, guys, have a good week. We'll finish up uh, next, next, next time.